This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 720, and this week we welcome Jeff Ryan and Gary Moore. We're going to talk about the ATI story, the Moore's family's restoration journey. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. And a shout out to our newest sponsor, BioPlanet, where health and technology meet, bioplanet.com. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, at IICRC.org. Dot org the restoration industry association ria at restorationindustry.org the environmental information association eia at eia-usa.org iaq radio industry sponsors are particles plus at particlesplus.com And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio trivia question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the z man Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Don Weeks, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, who was first to identify the total pollution exclusion as the insurance pollution exclusion, which eliminates virtually all coverage for pollution incidents, including those retained under the standard commercial general liability policy. This week, we've got a tough trivia question for you. Today's winner is going to be the first person to correctly answer all four parts of the question without a mistake. Here's today's four-part IAQ radio trivia question. Part one, in U.S. government contracting, identify the term defined as the hourly wage, usual benefits, and overtime paid to the majority of workers, laborers, and mechanics within a particular area. Part two, what is the minimum financial size of a qualifying project? Part three, what must be displayed on the work site and part four, name the law requiring all of the above. Back to you, Joe. Okay, Gary Moore is the founder and chairman of ATI. As an accomplished entrepreneur and industry pioneer, Gary followed his passion and established his own restoration and reconstruction services company in 1989 after working in the insurance restoration industry for 15 years. Jeff Moore is president and chief acquisitions officer for ATI. His current role involves overseeing mergers and acquisitions and ensuring ATI's continued expansion. Jeff also serves as vice president for the Restoration Industry Association, RIA. Over the past three decades, he's worked his way up through the ranks in the company, serving as executive vice president from 2012 to 2019, and then as co-president since 2019. And Ryan Moore is the president and chief growth officer of ATI Restoration, where he has driven remarkable success and growth for the company. Starting from the warehouse, Ryan's career journey exemplifies his dedication and deep understanding of the business. Ryan's exceptional leadership and dedication have earned him the coveted EY Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2023. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to have you. Thanks for having us, guys. Gary, let's start with you. You you um you did not attend an Ivy League business school or work at a hedge fund. How did you learn to finance and operate a business which is approaching a billion dollars in revenue? Well, first, in the very beginning, it's very meager financing. Uh, we uh, basically leveraged my personal assets to to start the business, and it kind of grew from there uh, to account receivable financing. And then uh, as time went on, we got uh, traditional bank financing. And then we grew the, the, the bank financing in you know, over 35 years, increasing the line of credit as we needed it. But uh, you know, recently, uh, we did partner with a private equity firm that helped us uh, with our acquisitions uh, on financing the acquisitions. So you kind of learned it on the fly, basically, huh? 
Yeah. Yes, I, I, I didn't realize in the very beginning that uh, uh, a bank would finance me in the very beginning because I didn't have any assets uh, except personal assets. Understood. You know, I think we've all been there, you know. I'm still there, Cliff. <laughs> when we need the bank, they don't need us as clients. And then, you know, once we're successful, then they're kind of happy to take you uh, as a client. Hey, Gary, how could you describe or how would you describe the culture at ATI, and how has it changed or evolved, you know, since the beginning of the company to what's going on currently? Well, originally it was simple, you know, it was myself uh, with basically leading by uh, an example, uh, very dedicated, of course, uh, uh, th there are several reasons. I mean, I wanted to be successful, uh, hard work, uh, but also uh, hiring the right people, uh, you know, people are the backbone of a, of a service industry, especially in the restoration business, and treated them uh, respectfully and also kind of treated them as family. And, and the culture may have changed some since we've gotten a little bit bigger, but it's still the same. We still value the relationships we have with our employees, our vendors, our subcontractors, and we still uh, treat everybody uh, as a family. You know, Gary, I'm curious. Again. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm just curious, Gary, did you always think you would bring the family into the business? Uh, I mean, I wanted to, uh, to, to bring them into the family, and, and that was my goal. And, and as soon as uh, they reached uh, you know, high school, I, I encouraged them to you know, work on a part-time basis during the summer and uh, – uh, so, yeah, yeah, it was my goal uh, to do that. And uh, you don't see too many companies uh, uh, that have all three sons uh, being successful and, and following me in the business. Do you have any, grandch any grandchildren in the business just as a follow-up at this point? Yeah. Well, we, we, we have a two-year-old and a 17-year-old, but, okay. uh, <laughs> but not, not yet. Okay. Getting close, though. Understood. Uh, understood. Uh, well, one of the, one, one of the good the, things, you know, just, you know, growing up in the business, you know, having kids, you know, Gary's got what, 11, how many grandkids? 11 grandchildren. 11 grandchildren. Um, the, the one thing I really appreciate about dad was not pushing us in the business. It was never expected. I think as a father, you always want your children to follow in your footsteps, but um, there was never pushing on his end. We just saw what he did and how hard he worked and how much he loved it. And we just naturally, I think all three joined the business. So I think that was something really cool that dad did. Well, yeah, kind of as a follow up to that, you know, this is kind of a dad question because uh, I kind of went through it with my father when I kind of helped him in his business. And I kind of went through it with my son uh, when he kind of helped me in the business. And, you know, the one thing that my dad was unable to do was to allow me to make a same mistake that he had made. And, uh, you know, there might be a problem and I had a different approach to it. And actually, my dad knew better, knew a lot better and knew that his approach was was best. And he wouldn't let me make the mistake. And then when I had my son in the business, um, you know, sometimes I had to bite my tongue or, <laughs> or, or cringe or whatever. But, you know, I, I tried to let him, you know, learn you know, from, from making the mistakes. That was one of the hardest things uh, about the relationship. And I was just wondering whether you kind of ever went through that with your kids where, you, you know, you can see they're kind of going down in the, the, you know, the wrong path regarding a certain situation or solution. <laughs> and what did you do or how did you handle it? Well, they started, uh, you know, working uh, operationally, you know, as, as a laborer, and then they moved up the ranks to, you know, project, uh, director and and you know running a office as well so you know they of course uh, learned through that process uh, but I think that the mistakes were uh, you know they had people and and ad advisors around them and, and you know most of the time so I think that if there was any mistakes or they were their learning mistakes not not anything crucial I think I think one of the keys to success, you know, is growing up is those mistakes are obviously going to be the best learning path for the future and allowing us to learn that on our own. I think one of the unique, unique rules that Gary had for us right out of college coming to work full time for ATI was, look, you can work anywhere. It just can't be for the branch that I'm in. Right. You, you've got to go out and earn a name for yourself and you've got to be able to learn and grow within the industry yourself. 
right? It's not at the influence of your father or our last name, right? So we had to go and work in a branch and work our way through the organization. I think that was a great learning tool for us, right? To learn on our own, to create our own names for ourselves in our own branch without the influence of our father, the founder of the company. And how many branches are there now? 72. 72 all over the country or are you around around the world as well? Just domestic. Just domestic right now? Okay. Any plans to go further? Always talking to people, but no, no immediate plans. But yeah, for the, the right company with the right culture and the right size and scale, we're, we're totally open. Yeah, we performed some work in, in Mexico. We did a few jobs in Mexico. We even did one in uh, Colombia. But uh, no, no, no serious plans to do that in the future. Cliff? Amazing. Well, uh, you know, there's three different guys here. And, you know, we have the, you know, the, the patron, the, the, you know, the father of the business. This we we have two sons, and I, 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 what are your? How would you describe your leadership and, and management styles? Are they all the same? Are they different? You know, Gary, let's start with you. Well, first of all, uh, I I wouldn't ask anybody to do something that I wouldn't do. Uh, uh, I hold myself accountable. Uh, I, I've been a visionary. Uh, there's been changes in the industry, and and uh, I understand trying to take advantage of those changes. I've been always open for uh, new approaches. Uh, I've been very self-motivated, confident, uh, and also uh, I've been very people-orientated. I, I surround myself with, 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 with good people. Jeff? Yeah, so I, I'd say I have some of the same characteristics as dad. I'd say things that are different from me and dad. I'm probably a little bit more vocal. I can be a little bit more direct, but um, definitely got that um hard working effort there's there's nothing i won't do anyone that reports to me you know there's you know whether it's out traveling out working those are all all qualities that dad got and dad got from his dad and so mm -hmm. you know leading by example i think is the most important part i think is uh, we've all grown we've matured as leaders i would say i was much harder to work for 15 years ago than i am today and i really believe in my people and if i've put you in a role i expect you to do your job and I don't need to handhold you. And uh, I've, I've put the best people in the industry, you know, underneath me and surrounding me. So I expect you to go out and do your job and I believe in them and support them. And so, which is very different than what I was coming out of college as a leader, where I was more of a micromanager and a little bit more difficult to work for and to work with than what I am now. Again, I think as the company's evolved, we've all changed and evolved as well. Ryan? Let's get to Ryan on that same question. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, so I, I think we all have our unique uh, characteristics and qualities as leaders. I think it's really what makes us uh, different versus, you know, a lot of the competition that's out there. In regards to myself, you know, having the leadership in front of me and the mentorship that I had growing up allowed me to carve out my own personality. You know, growing up playing sports my whole life, I'm more of a servant leader. Uh, I'm about building the team from the bottom up and going in it together. I, I would never ask an employee to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself, working from the bottom all the way up to the top of the business. Um, I think that's made us who we are. We have a great deep understanding, not only of ATI, but also the industry. And it allows us to build our team up and promote our employees from within to make them better and ultimately make the company better in the future. Joe? Cliff, all right, Gary, what was your um, your first acquisition and, and why? Uh, Mark One was our first acquisition and... Uh, it was very similar to, to my history. Uh, you had a family business. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Mark One is, was in business a little longer than I was. Uh, so they had the same kind of qualities, uh, employees, uh, had a diversity of clients. Uh, it just seemed, it just seemed right. It just, it just seemed like ATI was 30 years ago, uh, you know, smaller with the, with the few locations and, and it's been one of our successful acquisitions. Where are their headquarters? They're, they're based, they operate in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. There's also a second, uh, the founder, his son was working in the business. So there's a lot of familial ties as well that resembled, you know, what us and our dad have done as well. So, uh, but yeah, they had the time, oh, they saw three locations and basically all over Pennsylvania, Philadelphia mainly, and then all of New Jersey. Gotcha. Cliff? Yeah, you know, you have three different guys, you have three different, you know, personalities. 
uh, how did you decide among yourselves, you know, who was going to, to do what, you know, uh, you know, Jeff, you know, is an acquisitions, uh, you know, how, how did you make these decisions? Who was going to do what? Well, we have, uh, you know, different personalities and, and uh, Jeff's been involved in the, uh, uh, you know, the restoration industry for a long time and knows a lot of people in the industry and, and was just a, with his personality, it was just a natural to fit with uh, mergers and acquisitions and, mm -hmm. and uh, Ryan uh, uh, with his, uh, with his skills and his leadership was, was very vital in the sales organization. So it was just a natural uh, fit for Ryan as well. Yeah, I, I think the one thing that I love most about this family and this business is there's no ego uh, when it comes to the Moore family, when it comes to the leadership, and we're willing to do whatever it takes for the betterment of the organization, right? Whether that's, I need to be in ops today or I need to be in sales tomorrow, <laughs> whatever is the better decision for the company is what we're going to take. There is no ego at this family. There's no ego at the business. And I think that's who makes us who we are. You know, Jeff, you're the chief acquisitions officer. What's the biggest turn off? when you look at companies for acquisition? So my biggest turnoff is when uh, I've got an example where I spoke to him. It was literally a 10 minute conversation. I knew within the first two minutes, he wasn't a good fit. He spent, uh, you know, one of the first questions I asked was, why are you, why are you considering? Why do you want to partner with ATI? Why do you want to sell your business? And I think you can learn a lot about an individual on what's driving the decision. This particular owner was driving it and making the decision. He was, early forties. He's like, Jeff, the market's hot. I, you know, it's like someone who's selling a piece of real estate. Now I think I can get maximum value. Now I bought the business three years ago. I want someone who loves the industry, loves the business. Most importantly is talking about their employees. He never once mentioned anything about his employees. He didn't care about us, how his people were treated. He wanted to sell the business. This was a pure investment. And that's not something that long-term is going to work with our business and our culture. I want someone who's on board, who's in it to win it, not only for themselves, but most importantly for their employees. Because for a transaction to be successful, I need your employees. Owners retire, owners come and go. But at the end of the day, we're only as good, us included, even in our size, we're only as good as the frontline employees responding to jobs today. And I need everyone in the organization on board. And when an owner doesn't care about their employees, that's a major cultural turnoff. And I don't care what kind of revenue, I don't care what kind of EBITDA you're making, you're not a good fit for us. Interesting. Cliff? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as, as a follow-up to that, you know, after, you know, doing the 72, you know, acquisitions, uh, I'm sure that you found that a, a high percentage of people in the restoration business, I, I think, are what I would call cowboys. You know, I think they're confident. Uh, I, th I think they're independent. You know, a lot of times I think they're capable of selling jobs that they don't know how to do. You know, let's get the job first and, you know, kind of we'll, we'll, we'll sort out how to do it. And, uh, you know, when you have someone that's kind of used to that has a, a type A personality and is used to being in charge out of these 72 companies, um, you know, typically does the existing management and ownership stay and continue to work within the business or do do they kind of, you know, go, you know, ride off on their white horse and, and, and so on and so forth? Or is that just some of both? So we've got 72 offices to clarify. We've done about 15 acquisitions, but I would say of the 15 cliff, um, I think there was four owners that actually retired either um, or out of the business altogether when we did the transaction and management was already running the business. And then we had two or three owners that retired and, one to two years past, most of them were, you know, between 65 and 75 years old. That was a reason, you know, they were looking for a transaction or a transition plan. But with the other 11, they're all still working. They're happily engaged. Yes, there are some that are cowboys and harder to wrangle than others. But for the most part, I think it, go, it goes back to my first point. If you're, if you're doing a deal with a company for the right reasons, you're not doing it for ego. You're doing it because, you know, I, I can't compete in the market or I can't get the commercial work I, I, I don't have that I want to get. I don't know how to grow. Again, if it's for the right reasons, 
they're, they're checking that cowboy aside at the end of the day, we're, we're all fishing in the same pond. We're rowing in the same direction and it's been a really good transition. And I would say out of the 15, I don't know of any, maybe one I would have classified as a cowboy, but mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, one out of 15. But again, I think that comes down to why you're doing it more so and who we're choosing. And honestly, I spend most of my time choosing who's not a good partner and who's going to be challenging for us because uh, it, it's hard enough to, to transition a business and then to have a rogue owner. That's it's just a recipe for disaster, to be honest with you. I guess it's also really competitive right now. I mean, there are other companies buying up companies and there are, you know, venture capitalists buying up companies. Um, and if you're going to be, somewhat choosy that i don't know is it, is it make it does it make it tougher for you to find a good fit no honestly i'd say our culture uh the reputation we have i i think we're a suitor of choice for a lot of companies and so yes there are competitive deals where you could have there was a deal recently that had i think 23 offers for a business um mm -hmm. so you get one extreme and then i'll i'll tell you most of our deals are it's an owner that we either have a relationship with, knows of us, knows someone in the business and is coming to us and has already decided they want to sell their business to us. So you get mm -hmm. both extremes. Um, again, it, it really comes down to why you're choosing us or why we're choosing you. But yes, it's competitive um, and we're not always super competitive in a competitive marketplace. It's, you know, we're looking for the right buyer for the right reasons. We're not always looking to pay the most money or the best terms uh, where we, it's, it's kind of like doing restoration jobs. You know, you usually don't want to be the most expensive. If it's a competitive bid, I don't want to be the cheapest. I want to be right there in the middle. Ryan, I'm curious, you're the chief growth officer. Is there specific areas of the country that look like they're in a better position for growth than others and, and why? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think anyone that's known ATI over the last 35 years, predominantly, right, we, we, we've been dominating, I would say, the West Coast. So over the last two to three years with Jeff and his efforts on the acquisitions team and a couple organic uh, decisions, we actually have more offices now on the East Coast. Um, the difference being, though, we're much larger offices here on the West. So I think we are prime opportunities when we talk about national accounts and national clients. We now have that national footprint to go out and hit the marketplace. Um, a lot of these companies that we're acquiring, they are, you know, anywhere from five to $20 million, um, but primarily in the residential space. So we are really focused uh, commercially on the newly acquired companies, uh, you know, with a primary focus mainly in multifamily uh, and healthcare. We think, you know, those are probably the quickest areas of growth and focus for us over the next couple of years. What about wildfire response? Is that, do you see that as a big growth area? Uh, I mean, I think weather changing habits are, are a growth area for us all over the country. Um, you know, wildfires here specifically on the West, I think, ha have died down over the last couple of years. But as we all know in this industry, they're, they're rapidly coming back every three or four years. So, I mean, it's, it's, being, it's being prepared for the growth across the country. You know, we've uniquely grown and diversified our services over the years. So we have about 24 cat trailers uh, specifically placed all over the country to handle whether that's a freeze claim whether that's a fire claim or water claim, um, we have that unique ability to respond in all markets. Cliff? Yeah, do you have some sort of ATI university? You know, you have 15 different offices that probably did technical things, uh, maybe slightly different, maybe very different. And and how do you get everyone, you know, on the same page with, with products, with service, with equipment and and so on and so forth. How do you do that? So, yeah, uh, ATI University is something we, we pride ourselves on. Um, you know, we, I think in the calendar year of 2023, we had actually over 100,000 hours of training with all of our employees. And that, that's from basic training, whether that's computer skills, language skills, uh, leadership skills, uh, as well as, you know, the IICRC training guidelines that are out there. Um, we highly encourage on the onboarding process. We, you know, our whole onboarding process is ran through ATI University, and that's both a internal and an external tool. Um, as we continue to grow at the pace that we're growing, it's, it, you know, it does become difficult and challenging when you have, you know, 72 offices operating 72 different ways, right? So that, that is going to be a constant battle for us to get everybody, you really wanna, you know, give them 80% of the direction, that 20%, you kind of want them to have that entrepreneurial spirit to have them a little bit of leeway 
because not every market's the same, not every office is the same. You know, they're going to have uniqueness depending on the geography, the number of employees, and the services that they offer. Right? They have to have that little bit of leeway to make them unique in their own ways. I'm curious. Um, do you have like technical trainers in house, or do you subcontract that? How? Do you... Yes, we we have three trainers in house, and then we absolutely do uh, subcontracted. Uh, we do subcontracting with Reach Drying Academy as well as a, a multitude of other uh, companies that are out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I noticed in the bios that Jeff, you're the current vice president for RIA. I'm, I'm wondering, Gary, were you um, very involved with RIA during your journey here? Uh, no, it wasn't in the beginning. Uh, in some conferences, but uh, uh, there wasn't an RIA 35 years ago. There was not one. And Jeff, why are you so, you, you seem very uh, active in RIA and, and, and a big proponent of RIA. How do you think it's helped your company? So uh, I've been on the board twice now, and I think it's been, uh, it, RA has grown tremendously. You know, we are out there trying to tackle the most important issues. Um, we we can all try try and tackle things in a silo. You know, there are struggles like getting paid, working with TPAs, hiring people, um, legal issues. We can do that in a vacuum here at ATI if we wanted to. So can Belfour and SurfPro and Service Master. But coming together as a trade association gives us the size and scale and the ability. We're, we're looking to tackle issues that face all restorers. Average restorers doing $3 million. And so I feel like this industry has blessed my family for multiple lifetimes. And it's my time to give back to the industry that's blessed us left and right and trying to bring together the everyday restorer and the large restorers you know, we've got rebate programs now where we're talking to Lowe's and Home Depot and Sunbelt and all the vendors and suppliers that we use that we as ATI may already have discounts and rebates with, but your $3 million or the guy that left ATI that's starting his business last month, he doesn't have those rebates. They're not available for him. And that's why, you know, membership is $299 for first year members. And we want the everyday restorer to join because we're only as good as how many people we have joining the association and it's it's a battle. It's a hard industry that's evolving and changing on a daily basis. What my dad grew up in 20 years ago and when I started is very different than the struggles we have today. And I think that's our way of making sure we're working as one because at the end of the day, no matter what size and shape you are as a restorer, at the end they we're all doing the same service and we have the same problems. Cliff? Yeah. Um I got a quick follow up. Um, Go ahead, sir. All right. One of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of from the indoor air side of things. I, I, I've learned over the years about restoration, and I'm wondering, do you, um, do, do any of your groups, do you use these um, vendor programs? Do you encourage your groups to be a part of the vendor programs? Yes, I, I would say vendor programs, also known as TPAs, have been certainly a, a big recipe for success for ATI. It's you know, for any restorer out there, half the market loves them, half the market hates them. Um, they can be a necessary evil if you want to generate revenue. I think it helps create who ATI is today. And so we probably generate 15 to 20% of our revenue from TPAs. I wouldn't say all of our companies and all of our offices are active, uh, but we certainly encourage it. It is the most challenging and hardest jobs you will do in the market because you've got multiple people, you've got multiple point of contacts, you've got the insured, the TPA, the carrier, you've got many people auditing your estimates. There's lots of checks and balances that you have to do. And my philosophy is if you can do that effectively and make margin and make a good profit margin, even after you pay a TPA a fee, you can go out and do any job for any customer out there. And I think because of that, that has made us a better operator in our day to day business, not only in TPA, but on jobs outside of the TPAs as well. Yeah, we, we were approached about, yeah, we were approached about 20 years ago, a company called Prism. Uh, that was kind of the first TPA, right. and it was kind of skeptical at first, but at, at the same time, uh, it's something that we wanted to uh, be involved in and be a part of, and, uh, you know, the success, it was challenging at the time, and, and it, it has been successful since. You know, if, if we could just circle back for a minute, um, you know, Jeff, you were talking about giving back to the industry, and, and 
I happened to come across your article that that you wrote uh you know about adding a zero and in all honesty it's probably i i think the best article that i've ever read uh in, in terms of how to be successful in the disaster restoration business i mean literally from soup to nuts to where you want it to be and uh you know i'd like to thank you uh you know for the article and I think it's worthy of, you know, winning our IA's Patty Harmon Award. And honestly, I think it was really, really well done. And thanks for doing it. Back to you, Joe. All right, let's go to halftime. Uh, Grayson, you want to shoot us over and thank our sponsors? Before we do, I want to welcome BioPlanet, where health and technology meet at byoplanet.com. Our association sponsors are... AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA's multidisciplinary membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at EIA-USA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Industry sponsors are Particles Plus. Feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, particlesplus.com. All right, we're back with the second half of our interview. We've got Jeff, Ryan, and Gary Moore, the ATI story. Um, I've got a text question from the audience. One of you guys, whoever wants to jump on this one, um, has ATI ever been approached by a competitor to be acquired? And if so, how did you handle that situation? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 25, 28 years ago, I was approached and uh, I didn't want to really have anybody in the office know, but I thought it'd be interesting to hear their stories. I hadn't come in on a Saturday and I did have to disclose because my controller at the time came, worked on Saturday. So I had to let him know that I was entertaining a group that was coming in. So, uh, you know, I entertained the group and, and uh, it was uh, interesting what they were, you know, starting to do. But at the same time, I told them I had uh, sons of the business and, and I planned to, to have them uh, continue and, and be in the family business. And I, I said, I said, thanks, but no thanks. Now, that was some time ago, Gary, I, and I'm not sure how many years ago you started the acquisitions that you're currently, you know, part of the part of the family here. But did that that um, approach by an outsider, did that affect how you looked at maybe possibly acquiring companies down the road? Uh, no, not really. But as the industry grew and the consolidation grew, we as a family sat down and decided, uh, did we want to stay more of a uh, you know, large, medium-sized regional company, or, or did we want to stay and, and compete with the consolidation and, and be, you know, on a, on a national basis? And we as a family decided we wanted to, to be part of something that was bigger. Cliff? Yeah. Um, Ryan, this is, this is for you. Uh, you have, what is it, 72 offices. Are all of them full service? I mean, do they all do you know, structure, emergency service, uh, you know, contents cleaning, uh, so on and so forth, or do some specialize? No, uh, all of our offices are full service. Um, obviously, you know, some of the offices don't offer, you know, environmental in-house. Some of those might be subbed out, but for the betterment of the organization, almost all 72 are full service from emergency service all the way through construction. Joe? I noticed earlier, um, I think it was Jeff mentioned or, or Ryan that, that you do go after cat work. Um, and, and I'm, I'm wondering what, what are the kind of like the pros and cons to determining whether you're going to go after this cat work? 
You know, I, I think our philosophy on that has changed over the years. Um, you know, we, we've grown so much nationally and we have, we have a dedication to our existing clientele and our existing business. So when we talk about catastrophe work, it's really just large loss. Um, so what we've done is we actually go after our MSA, our master, master service agreement client. So first and foremost, you know, most of the time when there is a natural disaster that occurs in the United States, more than likely, we do have a brick and mortar within that vicinity. So what we're doing is we're just bringing in our national response services team that we have, and they come in and support the local office to service all of our national accounts. So we, we give a priority to all of our national agreements accounts, and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to disservice our local clients too in the local market. So that, that is the first and foremost, our focus as we go through any of the catastrophes that happen. Um, now, now, granted, if there is a, a loss that comes in by, by somebody seeing our truck across the street, you know, depending on the size and severity of it, we would absolutely take a look at that. But our first priority is going to be our clientele that we've already had existing prior to the event occurring. Gary, I'm curious. Um, it seems like going it, you know, going up against some of these other big companies that are buying a lot of companies, it, it's somewhat of a risk. Are you a natural risk taker? Well, yes. I mean, uh, starting in the very beginning as an entrepreneur, you have to take risk, you know, especially financial risk. But at the same time, uh, I've been in the industry a long time. I had the contacts, I had the, the confidence to, to start the business, but, you know, each, you know, I'd say each, the industry changes, uh, you have to be a calculator risk taker, uh, you know, to, to continue to grow and, and diversify your business and take advantage of, of new opportunities that come up. You know, I'm, I'm assuming that it made taking the risk, uh, the fact that you had Jeff Ryan and your family behind you and working with you made taking that risk a little easier. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, they have uh, added an extreme amount of value to the company and, and uh, you're right. The risk is at, at this point is, is, is more than calculated risk. It's a, it's a, you know, almost kind of a guaranteed risk, but, you know, during the, the course of growing, it was a, it was a risk, but it was a calculated risk. Cliff. Yeah. Um, we've all heard the old uh, adage, you know, nothing lasts forever. And one of the things Jeff, I got out of your, uh, at a zero article was your story about how you lost a major client and the impact that it had on your business and how it made ATI stronger. And, and it seems to me that while some of the audience comes from the restoration industry and, and probably read and appreciated the article, there are other listeners uh, th that haven't. And I think that they would all appreciate, you know, kind of like the the, the story that, that goes along with that. Yeah, so the example I, I provided in the article talks about a customer, and this, this applies to any customer of any size, but, you know, as I buy companies, you, you never want to have a concentration in an office or a business that you've got too much weighted on one particular customer. This happened to be out of our legacy office, our headquarters, which is here in Anaheim, where we're at today, and it was a residential insurance carrier. Uh, we were operating uh, through a TPA, and it was about a $5 million account for us. And we're probably doing guesstimating probably $12 million. So, I mean, may, maybe it was $15 million. I don't exactly remember the total revenue of that branch at the time, but that's, that's a big hit for, you know, any business mm -hmm. that's losing 40% of your revenue. And honestly, it took us, and this is a customer that works with us in other locations. So this isn't like a customer that fired the company. They fired mm -hmm. one office. Uh, we continue to service them in other locations. It took us 10 years to get back onto that program. It's still not the revenue that it once was. Honestly, we got back on that program in 2023. But I think as any business owner that's got a customer or if you're doing a lot of revenue, uh, the philosophy is you should always be able to lose your first or second largest customer. And if you've got too much concentration, you've got too many eggs in one basket. And just like just like a carrier or an owner doesn't want to put all their eggs in one basket. Uh, we don't want to put all of our eggs in a basket with one particular trade partner or subcontractor or employee. You need to be able to find and replace that revenue. And that was, that was really hard for that office to do. And it took some time, but um, quite honestly, that office at the time was primarily residential. And that office is not a fan of residential today. They still do it, 
uh, but they're primarily a commercial operator. And I think that's what kind of turned that office. And I think the mentality of all the staff around was losing that particular account. But I mean, reflecting back on it, you know, was it really something that you did wrong or, or was it just, you know, the customer, you know, because a lot of times we get that customer that regardless of what you do, you know, you can't satisfy them and, you know, they, 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 they appreciate nothing. <laughs> so uh, I'm just, you know, kind of wondering, you know, what was really behind it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think every every client is challenging in their own unique way, um, you know, but I, I honestly, I think it's, you know, you don't forget where your bread is buttered, right? As, as you're continuing to grow and expand, I, I think our, our philosophy in that branch, they got distracted by larger losses or more unique uh, opportunities, right? And they just took for granted the client that was always there, right? Mm -hmm. When Gary mentions Prism, that was one of those clients that was part of that that rotation. So that, that's been a client for us for 20 years. I just don't, I think they took it, uh, took it for granted and took advantage of it. And then that came back to bite them. And it took us forever to diversify our services to make up that revenue loss, right? So it was a huge learning experience from an office. Just, just because that client's always been there, you're only as good as the job you do today, right? It doesn't matter what you've done in the last four or five years for them. You're only as good as the job you do today. So this job, even though it may only be 2000 compared to a million, you've got to treat it the exact same. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great lesson for our audience. Um, Cliff had a question. It said, to do government work, you must be a union shop or pay compensation according to Davis-Bacon. I'm wondering, are there many union restoration companies out there? I, I can't think of one that comes to my mind. Um, they're on the environmental side, as you probably all know, that's uh, certainly a lot more common, but uh, there's no one that's a full-on union shop that I'm aware of that is a pure restoration company. Um, Any thoughts on why that true. is? I, I just I don't know that it's regulated. Yeah, you, you you can't you can't be union and do day-to-day -day restoration work in the industry. It just it, it's almost impossible. Uh, but I mean, there is plenty of Davis Bacon work, you know, with schools, government. Uh, that I think the, the whole industry uh, has to, you know, go through that process with the Davis-Bacon Act. I, I think some of it comes down to some of the challenges even in the RIA um, is we're, we're not always considered an industry. So if you look at Davis-Bacon wages, there's not a restoration wage in there, which I think is one of the reasons there's no union restoration contractors. We are, depending on the trade we're doing for the day, are we janitorial? Are we cleaning? Are we carpenters? Are we doing remediation work? Um, and depending on the day and the scope, you could have a different classification. And I think until the RA tackles and really defines that it's truly an industry within construction, um, I don't think you'll see much of a change there. Cliff, do you want to get one more in before we go to the roundup? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I would, and you know, it's probably going to be three more, but it's the, it's, it's, <laughs> it's 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 don't it's forget really, we have Pete coming on. I, no, I, 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 no, no, I, I understand. It's one question, but I'm looking for three different answers to it. I I I, I, I guess, uh, Ryan, what's your best story about your father? You know, your favorite story about your father. Uh, in the business or the restoration industry uh you know what's, what's yeah, the most I think, uh my, my my favorite story i mean i've got many of them to tell throughout the, the many years but I, I think the one that was most unique is every restoration or every restorer you know when COVID hit everybody had to adapt and everyone had to pivot and i think the uneasiness of not knowing what it was or the repercussions of it <clears throat> you know it was hard to operate the day-to-day -day of the business we, we've gotten a large loss from a, a very well-known client across the country mm -hmm. and we had our team talking about that loss and hey who's going to go out there you know it was almost quiet for the first you know 30 seconds and who's the first person to raise their voice in the middle of this in the heart of COVID is Gary goes well nobody's going to say anything I'll be on the first flight out of here I'll be out <laughs> there in an hour and a half right mm -hmm. I mean that that's just who he is as a person anytime something like that comes he's the first one to jump he's the first one to volunteer no questions asked. And I, I just think it was instrumental just showing who he is as a person and who he is as a leader. When there was so much uneasiness within the organization, he was the first one to jump in and say, you know what, I'm going. And sure enough, uh, he went out there with two other employees and he was the one walking that loss. Jeff, what about you? Your favorite story about your dad? 
So my favorite story, again, similar to Ryan's, uh, mine was actually 9-11. I remember doing a job at a major museum in San Francisco. And um, again, we're very strategic in how we respond to CAT now. And back then we weren't as strategic. We were, you know, brass knuckles, you know, get the revenue that you can. And dad called me up and said, you, me, and another guy are flying to New York. And, you know, here we are in little California business. I, what are we going to go do in New York? He's like, we're going to go get some jobs. We're going to help people and help restore some buildings. I'm like, but we don't know anyone in New York. He's like, well, we'll figure it out. We're going to get the yellow pages and we're going to make calls and we're going to go walk jobs and we're going to get revenue. And that's what we do. We figure things out. We're restorers and, you know, we, we go by the, the seat of our pants and the next thing you know, we ended up doing a couple jobs. We ended up calling business owners and help some businesses get back into business. And, you know, just good old brass knuckles, cold calling people, making it happen from the from one side of the country to the other and <clears throat> being on the first flight. You know, 9-11 was a, a scary time. I remember they evacuated the museum. We were the only ones allowed to stay in it. And we were literally on the first flight to New York. You know, everyone else is trying to get out and dad's trying to figure out a way to help people. People and not only that, put him himself first and be on the first plane from California over to New York to go help people. Okay. How did you staff those jobs? Uh, we, we have uh, uh, basically asked for uh, supervisors and uh, people to volunteer from different offices to help us. And then uh, in New York, uh, we used a, a temporary labor force to supplement uh uh, working with our supervision. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Cliff? Okay, Gary, what's your uh, favorite story about Ryan in the business? Yeah, uh, Ryan, uh, when, when he graduated from college, I, I made him a uh, basically an offer letter uh, with the salary, bonuses, benefits, and told him he had to uh, move. He had to go work out in our uh, uh, Simi Valley office out in Los Angeles, and and uh, he wanted to know when he could move back. And I said, "Well, you gotta, you gotta earn it. You gotta make some bonuses before you can have eligibility to move back somewhere else." And of course, he was successful and and moved from there to uh, run an office out in Riverside. And then uh, a, 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 another fun story was was we were doing some work in a hurricane year. We had a lot of work in Houston. We got some work in Florida. And uh, we were asked to go look at this job. And the only way to get there was by helicopter. And I sure didn't want to get on a helicopter. <laughs> so Ryan got the uh, short end of the, of the totem pole and he volunteered and went. And thank goodness in his backpack, he, he packed some, I think, some protein bars and some water and, and got on a helicopter. And unfortunately, I think he got stuck there for like four or five days with no food and no water and very, very minimal place to sleep. And, and uh, so, but he uh, was eager and willing to do it. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about Jeff? Yeah, uh, when Jeff graduated from college, you know, he was the first, the oldest and, and uh, uh, wanted to do, do the same thing, make him an offer uh, and told him he had to move as well. And he moved to San Francisco and he also said, well, when can I, you know, move back? And I said, well, you got to make bonuses in three quarters, consecutive quarters. And I think he'd make bonuses those first three quarters so he could move back to somewhere else. And and uh, uh, one job that uh, uh, I bid twice at a very large, it was during the mold hype at a hospital. I didn't get the job. And uh, I guess, fortunately, uh, a couple of competitors got it. And were not successful. So the third time, Jeff took responsibility uh, of taking responsibility of this job, and, and we took it over. And I still think it's maybe one of the largest jobs that ATI has done. It, it was a two, three year uh, project, and Jeff did an excellent job from the very beginning to uh, you know make it one of the largest jobs we've had at, with ATI. All right, let's go to the roundup, John. Oh, well, Grayson. All right, for this roundup, we want to welcome BioPlanet, BYOPlanet.com. All right, Cliff. Uh, well, let's first, let's bring in the restoration industry's global watchdog, Pete Consigli. Pete, do we have you? Yeah, 
I'm here, boys. There we go. He's got the RIA. He's flying the colors, looking good, Pete. Uh, I'm always, I'm always flying the colors. <laughs> hey, um, great job, uh, the Moore family. So I, I got three or four things here, and you know, I never really kind of know what I want to ask and what I'm going to say, because you know, the interview and how it's all set up really kind of comes from the process that that uh, uh, Joe and um, and Cliff do with the interview questions and all of that. Uh, but uh, so I listened to the show and then there's certain points that resonate with me. So I got three or four things here and it's kind of going to jump around for Gary and then maybe um, uh, Jeff and Ryan. The first thing is, uh, Gary, so, you know, you said 30 years ago the, there was no REA. Well, there wasn't an REA in the context of it is today. But of course, you know, the roots of, of the association goes back to 1946. But in the 1970s, when Marty King came to the association, we had the old, the National Institute of Fire Restoration, which really served all the early pioneers like yourself and many others. And uh, were you ever involved in the old ASCR and the and, uh, NIFRA Association back then? When was the first time, Gary, you can remember that you kind of came to the association, you know, within the industry? Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I've been in the industry for since the '70s, uh, and I don't remember anything uh, during that time frame. And and I was just so focused for the first five or, or ten years of ATI, just trying to open up a few more offices, and 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 uh, and then maybe after that realize that the association was viable, but I mean was was around, and but I didn't know it was around. Uh, you know, during my first probably five to 10 years uh, with ATI. Yeah, well, I, I actually appreciate that because I think that a lot of um, a lot of companies uh, uh, that um, start in the business and don't know about trade associations until they start seeking and looking for them. And particularly in those days, I mean, that, those are really early pioneers in those days, many of them. So to me, where companies like ATI in the Southern California market got on the, on the national radar was Northridge in 1994. So Jeff and Ryan, were you, you, were you guys in the business at the time? You were still in college and stuff, right? So Gary, I, I remember this before you guys moved up to the Bay area, because essentially you had that one Southern California office. So there, there were seven companies in Southern California. I, I kind of think they created this. I call them the Southern California mafia back in the day. And they, <laughs> They, they were the, the original uh, full service reconstruction kind of companies that eventually uh, got, went into mitigation. And uh, you kind of know who they were. I don't know if some of them are around any, anyway today, but there was Kenko, there was Harbro, there was, uh, uh, you know, you could probably name all of them. I remember there were seven of them. And I think at that time they recognized uh, that uh, there was a lot to be made in the, mit in the mitigation sector if you would because they were mostly reconstruction companies um i think the industry started to change from then gary so from that perspective on what did you see happening how do you think that impacted the industry and the, and kind of the the influx of these larger companies that started kind of coming into the mitigation in the the, the quote-unquote restoration space yeah, and in 1994 uh we were still mostly environmental and restoration and, and limited construction but you're right, after, after 94, 95, uh, there was some litigation in the industry with uh, construction companies. And I got my first call from a carrier uh, during that time frame. the big carrier says, well, I can't use this person and use this person, but I understand you do construction work, can you come visit with us? So basically during that Northridge earthquake, uh, my business expanded tremendously to the construction industry. And uh, today I would say 60% of our business is construction. Whereas back in 1994 is probably 10%. Yeah. So I'm going to segue now, Gary, uh, over to the boys uh, with that. Thank you for that input. Um, I think uh, the one thing I, I want to say about you, Gary, and I want this to be on the record and I want Cliff to note this. I want to publicly thank you for agreeing to host the ASCR in 2007. And Don Marvel, 
who Jeff told me when I saw him in St. Louis uh, at the AGA meeting this past at Woodage, he said, it's the longest serving op guy you have, Don Marvel, 29 years there. And I hadn't seen him in years. And he came up and said, hey, Pete, good to see you again. But he, he was the guy that uh, you turned it over to. He said, well, Don will take care of you. And uh, so that was our that was in 2007. There was the fall conference that we used to run back in the day. And uh, I remember that uh, the San Diego fires started. And in the hotel, smoke is pouring into the hotel. In, in, in Garden Grove, we're right next to Casino Land. The fires are starting. I, I think we're kind of good luck when it happened. When a lot of international people came, you guys were busy, but you still put that on. And I don't know, we had 50, 60 members came out. You did a nice barbecue, you did a complete tour to plant. By that time, you were into the contents. You know, you had all the vaults and all that. It was really, really nice. But there's a story behind that, and this is why it's so important. And Jeff, listen carefully to this, please. Um. At that time, you know, in the ni- in the 70s and 80s, when the industry was growing, the way that guys like Cliff, me, and a lot of our counterparts, the way we all grew was going to other members' facilities who opened up and did plant tours. And they didn't necessarily open the kimono all the way, but they shared pretty openly, took pictures, did that, and that's how we grew. Then all of a sudden, around that time before uh, I called you, Gary, I had seven other companies that had turned me down in Southern California to do this including some that are not even in business anymore that were part of that whole seven, eight, nine that I talked about. And so I remember I, I, uh, I talked to um, uh, Rusty and I said, Rusty, uh, he was, that was right around the time before he went to Belfort and all this kind of stuff. And it was real close, you know, when I did, that, I said, well, who do you got out in Sunday? Is he got a Belfort guy out there? You know, nobody wants to open the doors. And so he tells me to call Roger. I hadn't seen Roger in the longest time, and he came to Reno with his wife, Jeff. I don't even remember. But remember, Roger Kirkman came to Reno, and he came to the convention, and he said, hey, Pete, it was good. I said, Roger. He goes, yeah, we'd be more than happy to do it. He said, let me check with my people first. And he said, when he checked with his people, it's not that they didn't want to do it, but there was a blue. There were so many things going on. He said, we don't have the, the capacity. He said, why don't you call Gary Moore from ATI? I said, do you know him? I said, well, I don't know Gary, but I know the ATI company. I remember when I called you, Gary. I almost didn't finish the sentence and you said, we'll do it. Well, that says everything about everything that you all just said about your culture, about how you grew the company, about everything you did, that you were willing to do that. And then not only that, you didn't back out when months later you had to do it in this major fire in your region. So I, I think that's great. And, uh, Anyway, I personally appreciate that and want to tell you that. Now, Jeff, Jeff, um, so as we segue into the 21st century, um, I want to talk about 9-11, and I got two important things before I'm going to turn it back over to the boys. But uh, in um, in your piece, and quite frankly, anybody said it, Send an email to Michelle Blevins and tell her we don't need to have a vote for the for the Golden Quill Award this year. It should be net zero. I mean, the year that, <laughs> the, look, the year that Springer wrote uh, the uh, the the uh, the greatest need, you know, it, it was kind of a no brainer. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, I, I guess that's the Golden Quill. Well, you know, after listening to what uh, Cliff said about that, Jeff, your, your article is kind of in that same framework because you shared so much information. And you're only, you're transparent in a matter that a lot of members kind of w- wouldn't do that, but that kind of lends to, you know, opening the kimono in two seven and that whole kind of thing that I said. So I got a specific question about, and this is going to dovetail off of something that Cliff said a little bit earlier. Um, so, from a book of business standpoint, to have a stable company, you know, particularly that little story that you talked about, I lost that major account and it took you several years to build that office back up just generically speaking you can either tell me from the ati story and percentages if you know them off the top of your head or just generally speaking how do you think good successful restoration companies that want to go after multiple markets should set up their where their business comes from so what i mean by that is well so much directly from insurance carriers so much from tpa so much from the, the alternative markets like property, facility managers, government work, 
uh, you know, all these different areas that you go to. I mean, all those years when I, 20 years I lived in the Bay Area, before I went to work for Dry's, we opened up a lot of markets at that time in the appliance repair business, the waterbed business early on. They couldn't get insured. We did a, I did a lot of that work up in the Bay Area. We did, uh, we had uh, the home builders under warranty. You know, it was all those kind of things. I called it alternative business from direct insurance business. Talk to that and comment on that a little bit that Cliff could put in there. Just talk about percents and balance and not putting all your eggs in one basket, that kind of a thing. I think as a restorer, especially someone who's newer in the business, you, you want to be really good in one facet, whether that's residential work and you want to play and get work from adjusters and agents or TPAs, they're all relatively related. But what you don't want to do is go out there and shotgun it. And I want to work in hospitals. I want to work in basically any type of building. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get it. It doesn't mean that shotgun approach won't work. But as an example, if you want to do work in insurance, or if you want to do work in multifamily, be really good at it. There are some restorers I know that absolute dominate multifamily, um, uh, locally, regionally, and nationally, and really get into that market. I, you never want too much concentration. When I say concentration, I'm talking in one customer. I'm not talking one vertical. I've seen businesses that we've looked at, that we've acquired, that do 100% of their work in healthcare. Uh, we recently uh, acquired a business that did 60% of their business in hospitals, 40% in schools, they've never done a commercial job outside of those two business types. Uh, and it was a, f f call it a 10 to $20 million a year revenue business. And they absolutely dominate that market against us, against all of the other large major competitors. And so I just caution someone in putting too many eggs in too many baskets and kind of being a, a jack of nothing. Um, be a really expert in whatever business that you know, or most, most important, your team, your business development person, your general manager, what's their background? Invest in those areas before you try and tackle the world. Because tackling the world, it's expensive. You don't have control. Uh, you don't have a priority and a focus. And the second you don't have a focus on something, um, you, 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 you tend to lose business that way. Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't disagree with anything you said because I I get presentations in the 90s when I did a lot of marketing stuff with Dries and all and industry stuff talking about focus. I guess the, the intent of my question was, and this is a philosophy I had for a long time, and the two, the two people that did it the best, in my opinion, I could say who they are because they're both retired now. One was Frank Keaton and the other was Alan Gelts. And those were at the time when they were both we with DKI, obviously. And then, you know, they, Frank, I remember Frank in the day saying, he said the uh, Belfort is uh, the Indricon and then Belfort, their fishing pond was DKI because most of the companies they acquired, right? Well, the two, the two companies that never wanted to do that. And this is similar to what you said, Jeff, that uh, with both Frank and Alan, I asked them, they said they didn't actually want to go into that corporate structure. They wanted to main, maintain that, that private business and their personal stuff until eventually they were sold and they were acquired. And Frank kind of, well, everybody kind of knows, anyone has been around knows his story. And then Alan, the funny thing was, is Alan, then he went to go work for Rusty for a while in the New York market before, you know, he kind of totally retired. But I remember at the time, their, their general philosophy that I embraced for many years, have half of your business coming from the insurance sector, and the other half coming from all these alternative sources that we talked about. May not necessarily spread yourself thin to market to them, but what yeah. happened is they had better cash flow. And a lot of them would come in naturally. I guess that's it. I, I think to a certain degree, yeah, it kind of seems that's how ATI built back in the days. It kind of was an organic. Am I right on that? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. All right. The last thing I want to do is I want to talk about 9-11. It's interesting you brought it up. I, and I had no plans of, bring, of doing it. There's two major things that happened. Well, there's one really major thing in the industry that happened that nobody ever could talk about. And they might be able to talk about it one day because of company and the peoples that were involved not only are they retired but they also were um they were acquired and they changed i'll be careful here what i'm going to say um there was a major lawsuit at ground zero by uh, at least two ascrra member companies that i know of the government went after them and there was they went so the law wasn't so much a lawsuit it was the government going after them they wanted $50 million at the time in overtime pay. I don't know whether you ever heard about this. You know, you guys, Ryan and Jeff, you were kind of new 
moving up in the business with Gary. But what happened was, is it had to do with their supervisors and the difference between exempt and non-exempt. And a group of these supervisors got together who were in that kind of a, uh, the exempt the category, the category where they were being on a salary. And it was a borderline between kind of working supervisors and being managers where one, you don't have to pay overtime, the other you do. And that they went after them to pay all this overtime. And at the time, I remember talking to one of the guys who just recently retired from one of the big companies who's one of the big conglomerators. And so when do you think you'll ever be able to talk about this? This started, I started talking about that 15 years ago. I said, that'd be a really interesting story to tell the members to stay out of that. Because I remember after Katrina, that's when the government came down on how you hired the workforce, the laborers and all that kind of stuff. I remember talking, you're shaking your head, Ryan. I remember talking to all of the big companies. They had to pre-vet guys. You can't just have guys show up at the cat loss. I mean, a lot of the big operators, they say, if, if, you, if you provide labor, and you want to come work with us, you got to already be working with the local office in a particular area, right? Before we're going to bring you down to wherever the cat job is, because they've already been pre-vetted and everything. And uh, I don't ever know if that ever got settled, but I think it was a major threat to the industry. And it's a major pitfall that people could step into. You had, Did you have any issues like that or any comments or anything you make about that, about that particular thing of getting into that kind of trouble? Where, where the employees are going to come after you? No, I mean, we, our supervision that works on job sites are, are all going to be hourly. There may be someone like myself or project managers that are, you know, supervising multiple jobs or, or looking at jobs, but no, everybody that's uh, on a job site is, is on an hourly basis. So that hasn't happened to us. Yeah. This situation probably had to do with some of these PMs because these guys probably put multiple hours out there. And that's where the whole, that was the root of it way back in the day. I think it's still something that probably may already ex may exist. That, that could be a potential threat. And that's one of the benefits of the association, the advocacy, all the things that we're doing, Jeff, that we talk and address these kind of issues and how to help preserve the industry from threats and things of that particular nature that could affect companies. Um, the other thing that I will say, uh, did did you get burned on any nine eleven work and not get paid? No, we we uh, you know we were selective on on who we worked for and and especially at, the, at that time I was involved in it. So, you know, you know, getting a contract, getting a work authorization, uh, be sure that the insurance company was going to pay us uh, and put us our, our name on the draft. So no, we we didn't have any issues at that time. Yeah, well. I'll kind of close with this. Uh, Cliff, myself, uh, Rusty, you know, John, John Downey, even Joe Hughes, there were a bunch of us that in uh, 2014 went to a global infrastructure conference. We represented the industry, REA, IACRC. It was on Purdue campus. And uh, with RA represented restoration, we had guys from the National Demolition Association who represented the demo industry. They do a lot with the fire departments, they do all that, and they partner <laughs> with a lot of restoration companies. They happened to have a program at the Purdue just like restoration. And at the time, they also wound up having the same management company that we did many years back after we went out. So we kind of knew these guys. And I remember there were two guys in there that were their safety and health people pretty high up to been on the boards. And there was this one big burly guy uh, who had hands like he probably was a claw, right? He was from Chicago. And he sees his whole audience and he talks to the audience. He was talking about 9-11. And what happened at 9-11, a big, huge pile of debris it took months for it to be done. There were four companies who were major members of the Demolition Association that actually cleaned that pile after all the politicians left and did the real work with the fire department. Those four companies would be no different than a four or five big companies at RAA. You follow me with this story? And what had happened is the city, the state, whoever is responsible for paying them didn't pay any of them. And Three of them went out of business. The largest one was able to take the hit. And I remember this guy, and Cliff was there. 
We were in, we were in the room. This guy looked it over because the room was represented by all these facility people high up in government that influenced this. And he says, don't think for a minute the next time something happens, the demolition people will be there to help. He said, but the one thing I'll tell you, you need to pay your bills. <laughs> I, I never forget that. Maybe Cliff will comment on it. But that that's a message that our industry, through the advocacy, need to tell the people who we work with. We provide a service. We have a deal. They need to pay their bills and not string us out forever and think that, you know, we could finance these jobs and do this. They need to pay their bills. That's kind of something that's been a sore point with a lot of guys. And certainly anyone who's been able to do the TPA work has figured it out. And you're all shaking your head. I may, be, <laughs> I may be preaching to the choir, gentlemen, but you want to know what? That's an important message. And I think that bringing the RAA together and the work that uh, Jeff, you and your counterparts and on the board have brought this association back over, we're going on 80 years in a couple of years. We've been around eight decades. We've gone through changes and I have a lot of respect and, uh, really give a lot of credit to all the board and all the leadership that's that's happened here over the last several years to uh to to uh to be focused in on the uh the advocacy movement the education movement and and uh the uh, raising the bar and elevated movement which is a kind of the motto of the association so thank you for that thank you for the interview gentlemen thank you for sharing everything and uh like marty always used to say every time he talked to me he did something he go Keep up the good work, he said, Pete. And I'll tell you, ATI boys, keep up the good work. Back to you, Joe and Cliff. Thank you, Pete. Cliff, any final thoughts? Uh, I don't. I don't. I just want to first uh, give you all the last word. Is there anything we missed that you'd like to add? Any final thoughts? Uh, no. The, the only thing that what Pete just mentioned is uh, if there's a major earthquake, uh, let's say in California, the restoration industry needs to be sure to, to be aware of, uh, you know, there's no coverage. There's, there's, I would say out of 10 buildings, maybe two will have earthquake insurance. So be careful on who you work for and be choosy and be sure you get paid uh, on work that has some coverage issues. That's a great way to finish things up. My thanks to this week's guests, Jeff, Ryan, and Gary Moore, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. Grayson, Gone Fish and Fisher, our sponsors, and most importantly, our loyal audience. We'll be back live next Friday at noon, February 2nd. We'll be actually from the winter break, Pete's winter break in Bonita Springs. We're going to do a show with the current IAQA leadership on the past, present, and future of IAQA. Please come back and join us next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.